questions. Okay, let me start out with the most important thing. It was a lot of fun. There were no rules. In the early days of television, nobody could tell you what you couldn't do because nobody knew what you even could do with television. But it indeed was some of those things you mentioned. It was indeed nerve-wracking and difficult sometimes, but immensely exciting because we were in the middle of our new playground, if you will. And we were inventing television as we went along. You know, my first television show, which was on the eighth educational television station to go on the air in St. Louis, I was hired to do a five 45-minute shows a week. And the studio was a converted girls' gymnasium on the Washington University campus. They converted it into a studio by... <laughs> I forgot that. Just a moment. This is television, live television, and this is a live telephone, which we will now shut off. Oh, it's my next appointment. <laughs> okay, so this was a, a studio on the, on the campus of Washington University, I was saying, and I had no budget, I had one assistant, and nobody told me what they expected of me. Nobody said, this is what we want you to do. Nobody told me this is how to do it or what the content should be. So here I was standing, never having done television, never having done children's television, and having no idea what I was going to do. And we did it. And we did it every day for six months. And then the phone rang, and it was CBS. And my career t went off from there. But it was also fraught with danger. Um, Th things happened all the time. And when you finally ended up with it, um, you were able to do a prefrontal lobotomy on your own mind, which separating your brain into two spheres, so that if something in the studio was going absurdly wrong, you could still address the camera and the tongue was still going while the other part of the brain would say, what the hell is that going on over there? So yeah, you developed all of those abilities and the ability to be able to cope with almost any un untoward situation, because they were always coming up. We did a lot of things with Senator Kennedy. Um, he, uh, he would come on the show every year around uh, Christmas time and have a conversation with the kids who were on my show at that time. And he was wonderful because he, he loved doing that. He loved talking to the kids. Now, uh, some adults will talk at kids. Most of us will talk to kids. Very few know how to talk with kids. And if you watch him when he's with me and the kids are out there and sitting alongside me, he never takes his eyes off the kids. He doesn't talk to me. I, I'll ask him a question, and he'll look at the kids while he's giving the answer and say, well, do you and don't you? And he was evoking from them, so there was a relationship he sensed. He, so that was the wonderful thing about him, was that he had this interest in kids and, and was able to make contact with him because of that. And because of, of that, we, I got to know him. I went down to his place in McLean, Virginia, and did a show for the children of television, of um, ambassadors and, and, and uh, con con consulate people in Washington. And um, we had a nice relationship. I, I can't tell you I was a friend or he was a great friend of mine. But I would call him and say, I'm coming down to D.C. So, well, stop by the State Department. I'll, and he would take me, you know, he'd come out and we'd, he'd drive me to the airport and say, you want to come over for dinner? And I'd say, no, no, I want to go home to my kids in Connecticut, but thanks a lot. So, of course, when the tragedy struck, it was really quite a loss for the country, but a special one for me ended up at St. Patrick's for the, for the service and on the train with the body down to, the, to Washington, to the cemetery. I think we, it was a, a, a huge loss to the country. Did you, and when you saw him, I mean, what was the gap between, when was the last time you saw him? Was it a show? Last time I saw him, actually, I was going to call on somebody else at a, at a place called the UN Plaza, which is a very uh, lovely apartment building right off the UN site in New York. And I was going up to somebody else at the UN Plaza, but as it happens, he was coming down the lobby with his entourage on, on the way to California for the, primary, for the primary election. And we stopped and chatted. He said, well, when am I going to be on your show next? I said, anytime you want, Senator. He said, okay, when I come back, 
I want to do that. And I said, well, who do you do? And he said, okay, he, he'll be it. Raise your hand. And that's the last time I saw him. And of course, he went to California and was assassinated there. So the last time I saw him was just before that. The Golden Age of Television generally is, describes the remarkable output of dramas that we had live from about 53 to 57, where Marty, Days of Wine and Roses, uh, uh, things of that sort came out. At a remarkable time, a confluence of events and, and location and talent all coming together in that magical time. That was called the Golden Age of Television. We have another goal to hit television now, I think. I think the drama's coming out of HBO and some of the other cable companies, and now increasingly other sources like Netflix and so on, are, are a whole new golden age of television. So let's call that the original golden age of television, to exactly. be more precise. Now, you want to refer to my show, that's something else. That was a... Wonderama. Yeah. It was, um, it was a time when, when almost every major market had local children's shows that they put on and with children's hosts. Channel 5 at that time in New York had Chuck McCann, Sandy Becker, um, Soupy Sales. They were all on during the week. And then I had two shows, one Saturday and one Sunday. And that's a lot of production for a local station to be doing. I mean, my show, Four Hours, took pretty much the whole day to tape. Um, and that was three cameras and a whole that you know a whole technical staff and taping not so later on what happened it became cheaper for them to buy stuff off the shelf and not use the the studio time which economically made a lot of sense but there was a loss a loss it seems to me uh, I did a network television series on CBS before that, which was very successful. Well, let's take a trip, and I did other things. But that particular show, which was able to have an intimate connection with the kids, was unique in its time, in its place, and probably would you can't do it anymore. Just can't. The moment when you actually did walk out with your hands up, there were the moments of being locked in a, in a box car for eight days and n seven days and nights with no food or water and being bombed by the British on Christmas Eve. I mean, that's in the uh, You've heard of the expression, I got bombed on Christmas Eve. I mean, we got bombed on Christmas Eve, you know, literally. But I think the most, well, let me put it this way. The moment of transition for me was... The thing about being a prisoner of war is that the first thing is you become very passive, very helpless. It's sort of you surrender yourself to the fact that you no longer have any control over your, what you do or who you are or what you eat or anything. And so you, you let yourself go. There was an older man in the prison barracks. He must have been 28. That was an older man because I was 19. And he said, I want you to do two things. I want you to shave, and I want you to wash your socks. And that seems like two silly things to do, right? First of all, shaving, who cared how I looked? I, I, well, I'm going on a date that I know of. Also, we had, no, we had one razor for 240 men, one blade. It was almost impossible to shave. And we had no hot water. You had to go to an out, uh, outhouse to do that in the middle of a January cold January. But I agreed to do it. And I went out and maybe it took me 20 minutes to shave just with cold water. And every time I cut a follicle of my hair that brought tears to my eyes. But I did it. And then I, with my cold hands in this cold water, washed my one pair of socks. Okay, what did I accomplish with that? I really took back control of my own life. I really, we were still in a prison camp, but somewhere inside of me, the barbed wire had come down. So that was, to me, the most compelling moment.